The general reader will never know what a consummate ass he can become until he goes abroad. I speak now, of course, in the supposition that the gentle reader has never been abroad before and therefore is not already a consummate ass. Welcome to The Trouble Begins, presenting The Road to Being Mark Twain. My name is Jeffrey Weissman, and I'm honored that the Center for Mark Twain Studies has invited me to come and talk about my journey playing Mark Twain. The footage you just saw was me in 2008 playing Twain uh, on his trip to the uh, Holy Land there in 1867. And I'll get to that journey. I will talk about my own career and uh, studies of the craft of acting. And I want to thank once again, the Center for Mark Twain Studies at Quarry Hill in Elmira, the Elmira College, John Lam Joe Lamack, and all the scholars and fans. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be a part of this. I'm unfortunately not in Elmira as I originally planned and hoped to be uh, due to complications from the Delta variant. A lot of my gigs that were supporting me to get there uh, did not come through, but hopefully the door will still be open in the after times and I will get to visit and continue my studies because as you will learn, uh, I am working on some big projects that require consultations with scholars and input from others to help me, uh, help me on these two projects I'm working on. So once again, my name is Jeffrey Weissman. I uh, have been an actor pretty much as, as long as I can remember. Uh, if you'll bear with me for a second, I am going to give some, give some uh, shared screen here to uh, highlight my storytelling. And let's see if this works. The photo you see is uh, me actually in Israel uh, from um, the, uh, the project that that footage was from. Since I was a baby, uh, I have always been a playful soul. I, my sister was my companion, my audience, my support character, my co-conspirator in storytelling. I just couldn't get it out of my system. So in school, probably at about age 12 or so, I started taking it somewhat seriously and getting on the stage. Uh, let's see if we got, oh, uh, it's going much too, there we go. Uh, in junior high, uh, you can see me pictured here getting ready to play uh, Charles Condamine in Blythe Spirit, ninth grade. I continued in, in shows in high school, Merchant of Venice and uh, all sorts of other shows, uh, playing uh, Daniel Berrigan in The Trial of the Catonsville Nine, playing John Falstaff and Henry the Fourth Part One. I, I fell in love with the Shakespeare, the Bard, and found myself uh, even borrowing my costume here and going to the Renaissance Fair and discovering uh, my inner fool and letting it out. Uh, I performed uh, live for many years at the fairs as well as their Charles Dickens Christmas Fair. Here is Alfred Jingle Esquire from Pickwick Papers. And finding characters, not only uh, do I need to find the voice, the costume, the makeup as to wear the hair, uh, but also the, the psychological gesture as Michael Chekhov would talk, uh, what drives the character, the history and so on and so forth. Uh, I continue acting. Here I am uh, on stage still playing uh, Igor in uh, Young Frankenstein, the musical. Various other shows uh, I've been in over the years. So uh, my journey, um, when I was 18, I finally got to pursue my acting in a serious way. My parents actually never wanted me to become an actor. 
uh, and I got my foot in the door on several major motion picture studio lots by doing extra work and bits in films like The Rose, FM, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, though ultimately I found background work is not very uh, satisfying for an actor. So I went after training to be taken seriously and went to the American Conservatory Theater. And while doing my studies there and at the San Francisco State University, fell into an opportunity to screen test, to audition first and then was given a screen test for the lead in the film called War Games. When I came on the project originally, it was called The Genius. And uh, even though I did not land the part of David in War Games, uh, an agent pursued me and uh, had me move back to Los Angeles, where eventually, in about three months' time, I started working. My first co star role on film is in Twilight Zone movie. Director George Miller of the Mad Max series and Babe and other great films directed me uh, with John Lithgow and a wonderful ensemble cast. So I can move things around now. Then I worked on other films such as Crackers and Johnny Dangerously here pictured. Started working in television, guest starring on shows like Scarecrow and Mrs. King, Max Headroom, Dallas, later on Diagnosis Murder. Uh, here I uh, am in a Clint Eastwood's uh, Return to Westerns called Pale Rider, 1984, released in 85. It was really a thrill to play cowboy with Clint. In between film and television roles, I fell into an opportunity to sustain a living acting. I auditioned to play Stanley Laurel of Laurel and Hardy at Universal Studios in Hollywood in 1987. I, I worked from 87 to 2001 at Universal Studios. So if you came and had a photo with Laurel and Hardy, it's probably, it was probably me playing Stanley. Playing Stanley, at first I did not have the essence of Stan Laurel's character. It took me a while to get it. But eventually I, I found the voice, the physicalization. And I learned a lot uh, uh, that Stanley developed with his portrayal came from his many years watching great actors in the music halls. Same about a year after playing Stanley, I started playing Charlie Chaplin. And I learned also that Charlie borrowed from the greats. Stanley got his, his smile, as you can see here, from the great music hall comedian Dan Lino. Charlie got a lot of his style from the French comedian Max Linder, as you can see here, here he's pictured sans mustache. Finding the essence of the character, both uh, say Stanley's naivete, Charlie's mischief, then the physicalization, taking the heels off the shoes, walking flat footed, changing up the timing, all these different elements come into play in developing these characters. At the same time, I'm learning of the genius of these fine actors and fine talents. Now, when I worked on Diagnosis Murder as a guest star, it turned out, of course, that Dick Van Dyke had been very close to Stan Laurel. And here's a photo of us both doing our Stan Laurel impression. And we spent many hours talking about his relationship with Stan Lee and Buster Keaton and others and his work uh, in the tribute film, the comic that Carl Reiner directed him in. I also started putting together a Marx Brothers act, playing Groucho. Uh, because I played these characters and Universal played the licensing for those characters, I had many a time the opportunity to come in contact with folk from their estates. Robert Marx, uh, Groucho's nephew. Uh, he and I worked together for the City of Hope at a thousand dollar plate fundraiser in Beverly Hills. And I remember him telling me he was, I was his favorite Groucho. Uh, Lois Laurel, Stanley's daughter, and I became very good friends. Uh, I've rubbed elbows with many uh, silent and early Hollywood film legends, 
uh, meeting Anita Garvin and and Carlotta Monte and uh, May Clark. A really exciting uh, exposure to living legends who are mostly not with us anymore. And so I very I'm very honored to have the privilege that I fell into this type of work that took me to these great places. In between those years, about 1988, uh, I was contacted by a gentleman who mainly uh, handled lookalikes just and asked if I knew who Crispin Glover was and who I said, yes, actually, I, w I worked with him on the uh, film uh, with Dan O'Herlihy in 1983, the year before he got uh, the first Back to the Future film, they needed apparently a photo double for him. And uh, at the time I didn't realize that, that Crispin wasn't available uh, or, or I thought he wasn't available uh, when I was told that I would be taking over the role of Crispin after a screen test in this makeup to make it seem like they had him without having him. Uh, once again, to play this role, which ended up, of course, being very controversial, uh, I found Crispin's physicalizations, his vocal expression, hello, the placement of everything to mimic uh, him enough so we could recreate the enchantment under the sea dance, the fight with Biff in the parking lot, and then carry the character forward into the future. It took three and a half to four hours a day to apply these makeups, as you can see from this uh, video here. This is a unreleased video of me getting into the old George makeup here with some of the top makeup artists in Hollywood at the time. This is Sonny Berman of the Berman Brothers with Nancy Vasta. In a moment, you'll see working on Leah Thompson, uh, Marvin Westmore, Mike Mills from Beetlejuice. That also might be Kenny Mayer in there. Any anyway, legends of, of uh, Hollywood uh, makeup artists worked on us. If we needed to be on set by 9 a.m., we were in the makeup chair by 4 a.m. We get a little, little break at about uh, two hours in to have a, a bite of food and then back in the chair for applying the colors and, and wigs and such. Little did I know that the, uh, the producers didn't want me promoting myself and this ended up being a, a problem for me. And, and I also, having been friends with Crispin, helped him with his case when I, he decided to sue for them using his likeness and life mask without his permission. When that came out, I uh, sort of got into a predicament where I found that because I helped him, uh, my Hollywood career was kind of jeopardized. Nonetheless, uh, I pursue acting because it's in my system. And here, as you can see, the, the young George makeup. So playing the, uh, the role uh, was a mixed blessing in that uh, I actually wasn't prominent enough to uh, gain a lot of attention and help my career, yet now I've been discovered by the fans and luckily they've embraced me and I get to do fan cons around the world from time to time. And I'm appreciated for my acting uh, by an international fan base now. After uh, leaving Hollywood about 20 years ago, uh, I've continued working in independent films. Uh, I've put together playing Larry Fine of the Three Stooges team. I play multiple characters at events uh, such as Lobster Man or Comedia dell'arte characters such as Puccinella and Arlecchino. Independent films, uh, here a couple of shots from a film called Corked, which is now a cult film in which I play an obsessive compulsive winemaker. 
uh, a lovely short called Nobody's Laughing, which is online, both Vimeo and, and uh, YouTube, which is a, a lovely parable in which you see me here in the cloud makeup. Uh, another one called Savior of None, a low budget thriller in which I play an epileptic, uh, depressed widower who becomes the avenging angel of a young girl who's being abused in the foster care system. So I get to do some pretty good storytelling still. And in 2008, I was uh, recommended to audition for a project that eventually got picked up by PBS, Mark Twain's Journey to Jerusalem. It was originally called uh, Mark Twain Adventures in the Holy Land. When I got the call to audition, I really, you know, I knew some, something about Twain. I had read a, a few of his books. Um, and I, I went in and auditioned as best I could with what I could quickly study. Uh, I found a mustache and years after being cast, the director told me that she had looked at many, many actors here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And when I walked in, she said, I nailed it. I had a lot of confidence. I'd been doing living history for a number of years. And uh, of course, playing Groucho was used to cigars and uh, kind of owned the character. And she liked my confidence when I came in. So she cast me. We uh, began shooting in San Francisco on a tall ship for the embarkation uh, simulating New York. Uh, this was the very first commercial cruise out of New York to Europe with the highlight of the Holy Land. And I learned very quickly what I could of it. We, we went into production probably less than a week after I was cast. I had made some mistakes uh, assuming when I would skim through The Innocents Abroad and various other writings of this period, uh, things about Twain that, that I later, of course, learned I was mistaken and I'll, I'll share those as we go. But I needed to uh, find Twain's physicalization and his vocalization. Luckily, as many of you have probably seen, the Edison film that was taken uh, in Twain's last years. And I was able to get some of this movement that he has with his head and his physicalization while walking. And then researching, of course, I figured because he was raised in Hannibal, Missouri and came out West, that he would have a Missouri accent, which I tried to emulate in that clip that you saw at the beginning. Now in the final product, I don't, you don't hear me speak at all. That clip uh, unfortunately wasn't used. Uh, and they used, they wanted uh, Robin Williams to narrate. They couldn't get Robin, they ended up using Martin Sheen. If you see this, uh, it's now called Dreamland, Mark Twain in Jerusalem. I believe it's streaming on PBS channel. I found because Twain, even though he made dictaphone recordings, none of them are known to be extant, but his neighbor in Connecticut, William Gillette, who made famous the role of Sherlock Holmes, would often imitate Twain on his lecture series at universities. So there is a recording of William Gillette imitating Mark Twain's drawl and voice that you can hear on, on YouTube. And so I use that now for more of a basis for uh, the, my older Twain, which I'm now uh, portraying. I portrayed in the Twain's journey to the Holy Land, Twain uh, in his late thirties. And now that I'm older and uh, still doing Twain from time to time, um, I, I base it on the uh, Gillette imitation, which I believe is uh, was Twain in his dotage when he knew him, uh, and thus his imitation. There's here is shots, more shots from uh, after we shot in in San Francisco on the tall ship, uh, sort of battling the the Blue Angels flying over us in between takes. Uh, we went to Los Angeles where we uh, depicted. Twain in the uh, Bedouin huts and tents uh, at Velasquez Rocks, where we had a windstorm and a lot of our shoot almost got blown away. Uh, a week or two after wrapping in Los Angeles, myself, the producer, director, and cameraman went to Israel 
to shoot in Jerusalem and also the Sea of Galilee. So you can see from these shots where up there, the, the uh, Sea of Galilee, the, uh, in the Via de la Rosa, in the desert. Uh, I was really frightened. Uh, as, soon, as soon as we le left Tel Aviv and, and settled in Jerusalem, we went north up to the Sea of Galilee. And as soon as we got out of the city, uh, we were under a Scud missile attack. So if you remember back then, and Iraq was shooting missiles all the time. And our driver was like, this is nothing. We have maybe, you know, 100 of these a year. I was like, oh, dear. When we spotted this camel, it was like, quick, the director, quick, there's a camel. I need a shot of the camel. And I didn't want to get out of the van because we were under this scud attack. I mean, anyway. The executive producer of the project uh, had an interest in the International Hotel where Twain did stay in 1867. So we did shoot scenes there, which I don't believe are in the final edit. You often see me in the project writing as Twain with my left hand. What I had done in my brief time of research, I'd found a, somewhere mentioning that Twain in his later years uh, lost some usage of his right hand and taught himself how to write with his left hand. Little did I know Twain uh, wasn't left-handed that I depict in the, in the film. I think they probably had to reverse some of the shots. But I got to do my own makeup, my own mustache application, my wardrobe, take care of everything. I was sort of a one-man production team for myself as an actor, walking around the holy city there on the Sea of Galilee here, taking notes, observing, it was really a great experience. It was my first time uh, to Israel. While there, I helped make some magic happen. We were pretty much guerrilla filmmaking. We didn't necessarily have uh, permits to shoot everywhere they wanted to get shots of. When, for example, we got to the, the Wailing Wall, we found that cameras were not allowed at the Wailing Wall and they didn't have a permit. I talked Adam, our cinematographer, into putting on his largest lens and going past the line of demarca demarcation where cameras were allowed and that I would walk very slowly. And as I walked slowly, we got this shot, as you can see here, of a, uh, a timeless looking rabbi who's uh, inviting me in to uh, make a, say a prayer for my family. Uh, at the inner sanctum uh, where there's a, a Talmud, the Torah. And he helped me put a, a, po a prayer into the wall. Uh, it was very, very exciting for me. It was really thrilling. I also bought, as Twain did, a wood-covered Bible and for my mother. Who she was very appreciative. I know Twain did the same thing. I continue playing Twain. I uh, do a lot of living history uh, for the San Francisco Historic Society, the History Museum, sometimes the California Railroad Museum. I played T Twain for uh, three out of five years of the time travel weekends that I was also a director for. Twain often performed as the host of the Golden Melodeon Review, where we had such acts as Edwin Booth reciting Shakespeare and a lot of Crabtree uh, singing and, and Lola Montez doing her infamous spider dance. Twain was in the uh, Sierra foothills during much of this time. So it was kind of a natural to have him fit in there. And I had a few scholars actually visit and commend me on my work, which was really rewarding for me. I'm gonna try to back up here and see if I can get a few of the slides that I, I missed. No, I guess not. Some of the other shots that uh, we really wanted, but looked like there were, it was gonna be impossible to get. One was at the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, we arrived at the Holy Sepulcher at 5 a.m. to get a shot of Twain at Jesus' tomb. And there was already a line to get in to visit Jesus' tomb by these sects of Christianity that had come from around the world, or monks or Christian uh, uh, priests from the Philippines. There were the Greek Orthodox. There were all sorts of 
folk uh, trying to get into the Holy Sepulchre. And uh, so we got shots of Twain at, at various other, other uh, sites, like uh, the tomb of Adam and the tomb of David. And uh, I'm going to just briefly stop the share so I can get back on track with my, my slideshow. Give me a second here, bear with me that my technical prowess is not the best. Here, this is the shot I was hoping to, to show you. In the Holy Sepulchre, Now I'm in the way. Let's see if I can move that. In the Holy Sepulchre, uh, well, there at the uh, tomb of David, I, I met uh, a Palestinian janitor. I said, what are you doing? And I was, uh, I let him know I was playing Mark Twain. That we're visiting from, we're visiting, i try to remove this. Visiting from Hollywood. He was, oh, Hollywood, oh, very exciting. Uh, so we continued shooting at the Holy Sepulchre, and finally, at the end of the day, about three o'clock, we had an appointment with a helicopter to get an aerial shot of Jerusalem, and we we're on our way out, very disappointed we couldn't get Twain at Jesus' tomb, and I noticed as we were leaving that the tomb was closed for maintenance, and there was the uh, Palestinian janitor scraping the tile, you know, chewing gum off the tiles. And I, I said, look, uh, we are, we've been trying all day to get a shot of Twain here in Jesus' tomb. Is it possible we could come in just for 30 seconds or a minute? It was Hollywood, Hollywood, come in, come in, come in. And so we got the ungettable shot of Twain there at the uh, Holy Sepulchre. Which was, which was very rewarding. And then another shot that was ungettable that we got. Here we have it. In the Damascus, at the Damascus Gate. What happened was um, at the bottom of Damascus Gate is a modern flea market, which wasn't going to work for our uh, idea of the shot we wanted to get. The director thought, well, what if we got Twain up there in that window? of Damascus Gate. And uh, we went to where we thought the access to that window was, and there was an Israeli soldier with his machine gun. And we said, oh, well, we better forget about it. I said, wait, 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 let's try, let's try something. So that I got the cameraman and myself, and we went over to the soldier and said, excuse us, we're from Hollywood. We're trying to get this shot uh, of me as Twain because it looks too modern down below, and we're playing 1867. Would you be able to let me up there just for a moment uh, and I took out $20 to give him a tip for it. And he pointed his machine gun at me, his, his AK-47, whatever it was, and, and pointed me up through the door and uh, get up there now, he said. I was like, yes, sir. And as you can see, we got that other million dollar shot as nerve wracking as it was. <laughs> so once again, getting some million dollar shots, uh, really uh, eye-opening being in Jerusalem, getting to see the Arab quarter and seeing how the uh, inhabitants there in the Arab quarter really just throw their garbage out their window and, and it piles up and the mayor of Jerusalem makes them burn the, that pile once or twice a year. It's really shocking to see how different cultures are crammed in uh, the four quarters, different quarters of Jerusalem and the uh, magnificence of both the, the Dome of the Rock and the Holy Sepulcher and the Wailing Wall all right next to each other is quite the trip. Uh, a great experience for me. The, the, the show itself didn't get released for another 10 years. They, they didn't have the voiceover that they wanted. They didn't have uh, it finished and re-edited. Uh, but finally, just two years ago, it came out. And hopefully you saw it on PBS. And if not, you can find it streaming or even a hard copy. I've taken Twain 
uh, like I said, to living history events. Here I am riding a coach up there in Columbia, California, the Sierra foothills. And uh, there in Sacramento with the Delta King. And when the pandemic hit, if my uh, slide will change, let's see. I, of course, as an actor, was faced with uh, no work. All the conventions, fan cons, a couple of films, and uh, live gigs I had all evaporated, as they are doing again with the Delta variant. So uh, I found a few creative outlets doing online virtual entertainments, did some shows with a, a group out of London and some a pandemic version of Waiting for Godot with some high school buddies, thespian friends. Uh, but I thought, what, what can I do that's going to pay? Nothing, none of these things are paying. And so I thought, well, what if I, I did an educational entertainment based on Twain and his, uh, his, his being on one side of a controversy and then going over to the other side. And I found that if I did this with certain time periods, it would fit into the needs of the California Educational Department uh, requirements for eighth graders, some for fifth graders and even other schools. So I wanted to make a 12 part series uh, about Twain's you know, thoughts and life on uh, di different important topics. Well, as you can see, I grew a pandemic fur and shot a proof of concept that I first shot here using the pandemic fur uh, playing Simon Wheeler in the uh, telling the tale to Twain of the jumping frog story of Calaveras County. And then of course I had to play, play Twain next. So, I went to a friend when I was permitted and had this beard shaved, but saved the mustache so I could play Twain. And there's the final uh, look. And I used my living room and my kitchen and shot a proof of concept. Uh, I, I, I lost the, the mustache for the only other gig that I've had recently to play Doc Brown at a birthday party. And so I need, of course, to, um, I need to uh, have a replacement mustache, which one just, one just came in the mail. So I'll open this up for, you, for us to see if it works in just a moment here. But here is uh, a bit of the, teaser of Mark Twain's American history as I know it. These are tales of American history as I know it. My truth. As I open this package, this is a list of my bibliography that I'm calling from the details to fit the needs of the various episodes of Mark Twain American history. Probably about 30 different books that I'm drawing from. Oh, here we go. All right. You ready for this? Let's uh, stop the share for a second. Um, here we go. Let me just go up here to this and show you this mustache that's just come. Of course, it isn't trimmed yet. Boy, that's a nice big bushy guy. That's great. We'll we'll do some of the trimming here so it covers the lip like like Twain often had, and it's finally the color to match my graying hair. <laughs> the idea is I'm putting the, the polishing uh oh no don't need that I'm put, putting the uh, polishing finishing touches on 
my uh, pilot for Mark Twain's American history. And I'm wondering why I can't see if I'm sharing the right. Uh, I wanted to share the episodes that I'm uh, developing. Okay. Hmm. Stop the share for a moment. And here we go. Hopefully you can see, I'm not seeing it, but hopefully you can. The various episodes are, The Miner's Culture, Women's Suffrage, The Abolitionist Question, The Anti-Imperialist Movement, and Animal Rights. Uh, the Proof of Concept has a bit of the Miner's Culture of the pilot, uh, wherein uh, we explain what brought Twain West, you know, uh, taking it on the lamb after uh, mistakenly joining the Confederacy and, and uh, going AWOL working for his brother and not getting paid in the Nevada territory and becoming a miner and then reporter. And then what drove him from San Francisco to take it on the lamb up to Jackass Hill and finding, uh, hearing the uh, jumping frog story. And women's suffrage, of course, he had a, a early article, another known sort of misogynist uh, viewpoints. And then his beloved Livy, Olivia, uh, knocking him over the head and getting him to wake up uh, and start uh, being on the right side of women's suffrage, giving women rights. The abolitionist question, of course, when he was when he was growing up, he uh, didn't see anything wrong with the, his uncle's farm having slaves, and uh, it wasn't until he was a riverboat captain that he apparently saw the misery of slaves being transported down the Mississippi, and then, of course later on hearing the touching story of Aunt Rachel and all, that'll be a very potent episode. Hopefully having an actress portray Aunt Rachel telling the story that moved Twain and his family so much. Then of course the anti-imperialist anti movement when, when Twain spoke out against Teddy Roosevelt and, and uh, the unmerited, he felt, uh, attacks on Puerto Rico and the Philippines. And then of course, his, his daughter Clara's uh, heartfelt striving for rights for animals with making hats for horses. And, and of course, Susie uh, comes into play here too uh, with the, uh, the, was it the general's horses story, which was based on his beloved Susie. So I, I have the need to get to Elmira to do more research and hopefully meet with scholars and get their input on these various uh, chapters. And uh, I really look forward to it. I, I've had a, an amazing journey, both as an actor and as Twain. I, I've been able to get some sustainability from live work and hopefully this educational series will get sold. Uh, or at least some investment so I can develop it more to sell it. And I also am working on a, a one-man show based on Twain's uh, tragedies called Twain's Shadow. Uh, he was plagued with illness as a child, on death's bed a few times, kept pulling through, uh, death of his father, then uh, his struggles with his brother and, and going AWOL in the Confederacy, uh, his trouble with his truth, telling truth in the press and hot water that got him into with his Irish uh, paper publishers and, and the local constabulary, constabulary. The chief of police uh, had it out for him because he exposed how, how Twain was, Twain exposed rather how uh, the citizenry of, of San Francisco would beat up the Chinese and the police would look the other way. And so when the police had a chance to rough Twain up or put him in jail, he knew it was coming. That's what got him to hightail it to Jackass Hill. Then of course the tragedies that befell him with uh, 
first of all, his, his father-in-law's death and then his baby boy's death, uh, friends of the family's death, uh, immediately, shortly after marrying Livy, the terrible tragedies with his bankruptcies, bad investments, um, and then of course, uh, losing uh, dear Susie and Livy and uh, kind of manipulations that plagued him at the end of his life by others. So there's great, great food for a dra dramatic storytelling there. So that's, that's something I'm trying to develop into a script form as well. I'm sorry I'm not there live to take your questions, but I'm really happy that you took the time to just watch my little journey. And I hope to be there in Elmira in the near future. Stay well, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, thank you again.